Thank you for uh, joining this investor webinar with ASX listed Hexagon Energy Materials. The ticker there is HXG. Uh, Hexagon is a project development company focused on a, a large scale low emissions ammonia project uh, called WAH2 here in uh, Western Australia. Uh, heading the call today, we have uh, Stephen Hall, who's the CEO of Hexagon and formerly a very senior executive of Woodside for many decades. Uh, he leads a highly experienced team of senior en energy executives over at Hexagon, which explains the uh, rapid progress made to date and is key to how Hexagon will deliver such a large, exciting development. Um, the latest milestone, as we saw, was the gas agreement announced with the uh, 280 billion US dollar market cap super major Chevron. So a great achievement. And uh, on the back of that announcement, uh, Stephen is going to provide today an update on Hexagon and progress of the project. Um, Stephen will make some comments, uh, run through some slides first for about 15 to 20 minutes. And then there will be an opportunity after that to ask questions uh, via the chat function on Zoom. So please enter them at uh, any point and we'll uh, get to them at the end. So uh, over to you, Stephen. Great, thanks, uh, thanks for the introduction there, Aidan, and uh, welcome everybody to the, uh, to the call. Um, Aidan, you stole my thunder a bit there, but yeah, we, we had put out a really significant announcement on Monday. The idea today is to update you on uh, what that means uh, for, for our company and our project and answer any questions that, uh, that you might have. The slides, and I'll apologize in advance, the slides um, I'm having to sort of ask to be uh, moved from slide to slide because I don't have them uh, working on my, uh, on my desktop, so apologies for that. The slides will be available um, at, the, uh, at the Hexagon website and also on the ASX platform, um, including the uh, disclaimer, um, which was the slide that was, uh, was just up there. Um, I'm going to start by talking a little bit about uh, reminding you about the, uh, the company for those of you who might not be so familiar. I'll then talk a little bit about the market opportunity that we are so excited about. Um, and then um, we'll home in on the uh, on the project, the recent announcement, and what all that means for the uh, for the way forward. Uh, next, please. So, in in a nutshell, Hexagon we're a, we're a ASX listed project developer. We are focused on developing a low emissions or clean ammonia project, which we call WAH two. Uh, we're targeting a very substantial growth market um, opportunity, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that. And we are the leading clean ammonia project in Australia in terms of meeting that market demand. And again, I'll explain what I mean by that um, as we walk through the slides. Um, we are on track for feed entry at the end of this year. Um, and as we approach feed entry, we see multiple um, re-rating events. Um, uh, as uh, agreements get published. Um, looking slightly longer term, um, it, we're looking to take final investment decision on our project at the end of next year, 2025. And next. We're a small company, as you can see from, um, see from some of the numbers on the slide, but, but what's really is exciting is that we're, we're at a real inflection point now, and we're starting to see the, the work that we've been doing over the last couple of years starting to be reflected in the company's valuation. Um, you can see on the chart that um, we've, uh, share prices increased by some 200% over, um, over the last 12 months. And as I said, we expect further re-rating as, um, as we move towards planned feed entry at the end of this year, so you know, in, in a couple of months. Next. And again, as, as Aidan alluded to, the, the reason we're here is because of the team that we've um, been able to assemble. Uh, I won't go into the detail here. You, you can read it at your leisure, but I guess the takeaways are that We've got a really well balanced board. They've got the uh, they've got a track record of creating billion dollar enterprises from inception. Um, in terms of the executive um, and the leadership team, 
where there's a very strong ex Woodside, ex Chevron um, feel about us. We have um, over 80 years combined experience, and that experience is delivering energy solutions to Asia, um, particularly around LNG, which is, if you like, the role model for what um, people are trying to do with clean ammonia. Um, so um, we've got the right team in place to deliver. Um, having said all of that, uh, that wouldn't mean anything if we didn't have the best quality technical work. And that's where um, Petrofac come in um, as our lead engineer and obviously a, an internationally uh, renowned company. And Topso um, as the provider of the fundamental technology that we're using to make our ammonia. And Topso uh, arguably the world leader um, in um, hydrogen and ammonia technology, particularly for low emissions or clean usage cases. Um, maybe go straight on to the next one. So, so in terms of the opportunity, um, we're, we're targeting two markets. And the first of those is displacing coal in thermal power or thermal coal-fired power stations in Asia, particularly in Japan and in South Korea. And the reason for that is that using ammonia instead of coal is a key part of those countries' decarbonization strategy. The government and the government has set significant targets for the import of clean energy and the import of clean energy before 2030, um, uh, to be specific. The second market is displacing. Uh, marine fuel oil or, and diesel um, as the fuel for bulk carriers that export iron ore from northern Australia or northern WA um, to Asia. And that market is driven by uh, the International Maritime Organization's decarbonisation targets. And really the only way those targets can be met is by using a different fuel and ammonia, clean ammonia, is emerging as um, one of the favorites there. What this means is that there's a very significant market and it's an, it's an undersupplied market. Uh, to give you an idea, in Japan alone, we expect the uh, clean ammonia uh, market to be 20 million tons per annum by the middle of the next decade. To give you, uh, to put that into perspective, that uh, 20 million tons is about 30 times the uh, annual output of our phase one plant, which is 600,000 um, tons a year. And fundamentally, the, these markets uh, are being driven by government um, targets on decarbonization and the incentives that governments are, are putting in place to enable the necessary investment. Um, and we're seeing really strong market pull from places like Japan with the significant um, commitment to incentives uh, that the Japanese government has shown. We're also seeing um, increasing support from the Australian government to help Australian uh, companies um, develop the supply to meet that demand. And of course, that fits very comfortably with the Australian government's um, objective of Australia becoming a leading clean energy exporter to ammonia. So in other words, future-proofing Australia's uh, exports. Japan, Japan's been um, very clear on what is required um, to, to meet the requirements of their market. And in a nutshell, Hexagon um, either meets or exceeds each of those criteria. So on the emissions front, um, our emissions are a fraction of the, um, of the threshold for, for clean uh, ammonia. Um, our cost of supply is competitive. And this cost of supply is from our PFS, um, which was published um, Q3 last year. These numbers will be updated um, as we pull together our um, pre-feed work 
um, towards the end of the year. Um, and as we've been working through pre-feed, we've been working through a range of um, improvement opportunities that we'd identified um, earlier. And I guess finally, um, security of supply. Um, I mean, it's not just having an Australian address that, that's important here. And you know, that, that is important. Japan, for instance, has been very clear that it wants Australia as part of its supply portfolio. But um, it, it's, also, it's also important um, to have the right personal relationships. And that's where um, the leadership team that Hexagon's got, where we have um, personal relationships that have been developed over decades with the Asian counterparties that are now looking to be part of the um, clean ammonia business. So um, we, uh, we feel well placed um, there as well. Uh, next. And we, we, are, we are where we are um, by design, not accident. So it, it's, the, it's the decisions that, that we've made that have placed Hexagon in the, in the very advantageous position that it's in today. And I mean, just to sort of expand on that a little bit, um, well, target markets we've, we've already talked about, substantial markets undersupplied. Importantly, um, they offer long-term offtake contracts, which of course are important for us in terms of underpinning our future revenue uh, and our investment proposition. In terms of technology, we have chosen to use established technology um, and the reason for that is that it is lower cost, it's available now, um, and so it gives us significant cost schedule and risk advantages over electrolysis-based alternatives. In terms of execution strategy, um, we are working with established input providers, so people that know and are experts in what they're doing in each aspect of our project, and we're looking to leverage existing infrastructure wherever we can. The, the reason for this, of course, is that it enables us uh, to have opportunities to shorten our schedule and also to reduce the, uh, the unit cost of our, of our product. Um, site selection, um, I'll talk a little bit more about this later, but effectively uh, we've chosen a site that basically gives us efficient access to everything that we need. And that is, when you look at it, actually unique in Australia. Um, the site also actually gives us some uh, additional inf uh, infrastructure sharing opportunities that we're, uh, that we're pursuing. And then of course, you need the team to deliver it. And we feel that we've got that as I, as I alluded to earlier. Um, next slide, please. And I guess if you, if, if you step back and look at the macro environment, um, we're, we're, we're extremely encouraged. I mean, it's evolving as we, as we thought it would, but you can never be certain. Um, but really we see the planets aligning for us. Um, there's an increasing need for clean energy and that hunger I think is growing. As, as other projects fall by the wayside. And of course, it's clean energy before 2030, which is when people have made commitments to decarbonize. Um, also, our project explicitly helps meet the objective of governments, the West Australian government, the Australian government, and overseas governments like in Japan. And alongside that, we're seeing substantial cost growth in, in the competing technologies such as electrolysis. So all of those things, if you like, align and um, give us encouragement um, in terms of moving forward. Uh, next. So now let's, let's look at the project itself. Um, and, and this sort of conceptually shows what, uh, what we're talking about. So um, we take natural gas as a feedstock um, and some water. We use existing technology and it's Topso's autothermal reforming technology um, to turn that, um, to turn those inputs into hydrogen, which we then add 
nitrogen two to make ammonia. Because of the way that we've configured the plant and the technology, we can capture virtually all of the CO2 that's associated with the manufacturing process. That enables us to transport that CO2 via pipeline to a third party sequestration site where it's stored permanently underground. And of course, it's that capturing the CO2 and storing it permanently underground that makes our ammonia clean. Um, the clean ammonia is then transported via pipeline to port where it's loaded onto a ship. And the ship is either a, bulk, a gas carrier that would take um, uh, the ammonia to, for instance, Japan, um, or it would be a bunker vessel, which would then take the ammonia to be used as a fuel to refuel the iron ore carriers um, nearby. Um, and as I mentioned before, we're looking at producing 600,000 tons of ammonia per year in phase one of the project. Next. In terms of our site, um, it, frankly, it's a critical asset for the project. And um, uh, we're delighted uh, once we recognize the site and then we manage to secure it. Um, the significance is that we're, um, we're immediately adjacent to the main gas pipeline. So we have a ready supply of gas. Um, we are also immediately adjacent to an infrastructure corridor, which is the green line on the map, which gives us access to the existing deep water port of Dampier, which can export our ammonia through facilities that it already has. There is no expansion or investment, if you like, required. The infrastructure corridor also gives us access to each of the two CCS projects that we are considering um, as, our, as our CCS provider. And um, as we announced to the market earlier this year, we've also secured water um, from nearby. Each of these um, aspects help underpin the competitiveness of our project. So effectively, um, the competitiveness comes from the two, two key things we've chosen to do, use existing technology and locate our plant in this, uh, at this site. Uh, next. I mentioned that we were um, working with established players in all of these things. And you can, you can see from the logos on the right hand side, the sort of players that we're reaching agreements with. So development WA in terms of the option for lease, Pilbara ports for access to Dampier port, Petrofac and Topso for the, um, for the fundamental engineering, the water corporation for our water supply, Chevron um, for a large portion of our gas supply. And, as we continue ongoing discussions around gas supply, CO2 sequestration and the like, you'll see, um, you'll see other logos or you can expect to see other logos that you recognize um, appear on the right hand side of this chart. Uh, next. I, I mentioned earlier when we were talking about the market that um, Australia is seen as an important um, part of the supply portfolio for, for people like, uh, for places like uh, Japan, which sort of begs the question, well, who's who in, um, in Australia then? And that's what this slide um, seeks to address. So there's been over 140 hydrogen related projects uh, announced in Australia, but of those only 30, are looking at uh, low emissions ammonia as the product, and so therefore potentially competing with us. And, but of those, the vast majority are electrolysis based. So they have the cost schedule disadvantages, if you like, compared with our project. And in fact, there are only five um, projects in Australia that are based on gas reforming with, with CCS. And of those, there is only one, which of course is us, which um, has access to an established deep water port and has mature CCS projects nearby. So um, it's that um, position that makes us so confident that we're the leading um, 
project in Australia. Uh, next slide, please. So in terms of uh, focusing in on the project and where we are, um, there's a bit of detail on this slide, but, but just to sort of help navigate it, the, the bottom line is that um, we're charging towards our planned feed entry, which, is get, uh, which we think is going to be around the end of the year. Um, we already have a lot of the key elements of the project in place. So the, the ticks on the right hand side refer to um, the project site, uh, the, the plant design, um, water supply, 60% um, of our gas supply already in place, um, the availability of, per, uh, of um, port facilities, and the, uh, the MOU we have with Oceana to develop a bunkering business. Um, the, uh, the little sort of wheel icon is uh, indicating work in progress where we have ongoing discussions on all of those other elements of the project. So with other gas suppliers for the balance of our needs, uh, for CCS, CO2 pipeline, um, and the like. And the... The announcement with Chevron um, is significant um, in a couple of ways. It um, other, other people that we talked to about the project, many of them felt that gas supply were the, was, um, was a concern. Um, we saw it as a risk of the project, but we were quietly confident of, of securing supply. But the demonstration of that agreement with Chevron has really um, demonstrated the availability of gas and has sort of de-risked the project um, uh, from many people's perspective in terms of gas supply, but in terms of the, the confidence of a, a, a company the size of Chevron um, uh, progressing the agreement with us. Um, as we, um, so in terms of moving forward, what we're um, expecting to happen is that uh, the confidential discussions we're having at the moment will mature into um, agreements in the near term um, with that Chevron agreement effectively being a catalyst for that. Once we have um, those in place, our focus will move to um, offtake and if equity participation discussions um, and uh, as we move closer to feed entry. Uh, next, in fact, skip over this one to the next one. I want to make sure I leave, I leave time for questions. So, I mean, just to finish maybe with the timeline. So we're rapidly approaching the end of um, pre-feed and we look to enter feed at the end of the year. Feed is a, is a year long. So we'd be looking to take final investment decision on the project um, at the end of 2025 and it's a three year constructing commission. So our production would be at the end of 2028, um, significantly in advance of the 2030 um, target that many have for decarbonization. Um, at the moment, Hexagon is 100% of the project. We will be reducing our equity as strategic partners come in. Um, through feed and to FID. And at the time we're at FID, we expect to be uh, one third equity um, in the project. Skip um, forward to the next one. And, and I'll, I'll leave it here actually, Aidan, and hand back to you. And um, hopefully we've, uh, we've got some questions. Thank you, Stephen, uh, for a great run through and congratulations to you and the team on the uh, progress to date. It's been tremendous. Um, a reminder, as Stephen just said, you can post any questions now uh, via the uh, chat function. So I can see a few starting to uh, pop up. But while we wait for a few more, um, I was like a good summation at the end, Stephen. Perhaps uh, sum up for us in three or four key bullet points, the, uh, the takeaways that make the uh, WAH2 and uh, project in Hexagon such an, uh, an attractive investment opportunity and always looking forward what two to three key milestones should investors be looking out for in the coming months? 
Uh, sure. Um, I guess in, in a nutshell, um, ammonia is increasingly seen as a leading solution for the energy transition. It's a very large, growing and undersupplied market. Our project is the best place project in Australia to supply that market. And the announcement we made on Monday um, around Chevron and gas supply is extremely significant. It de-risks the project and shows confidence in the project. Um, in terms of uh, milestones coming forward. It's really a series, I'd expect a series of announcements as commercial agreements uh, get formalized and then leading up to feed entry as uh, the main event, if you like, in the near term. Right. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, questions are now coming through. Uh, I think there's a couple here on the Woodside transaction in the US, $3 billion transaction, um, you know, what conditions, condition precedents does that um, have for your project? And uh, the second question along similar lines, um, how does that project compare and contrast uh, to yours? And um, um, what would Woodside uh, be looking to do perhaps here in Australia in a similar guise? So. Okay, I'll try and remember all the questions. Um, uh, so, so we, yeah, we, Woodside bought the OCI um, project in the US um, earlier this year. There are a lot of um, similarities between that project and what we're trying to do. So um, using gas as the feedstock, the choice of ATR technology, using uh, third-party CCS services, and Woodside have been very explicit publicly that they're targeting the same markets that we are, displacing coal for power, displacing fuel, oil and diesel um, as a fuel for heavy shipping. So um, in that context, we, we see uh, Woodside's investment in the project as a, as a real vote of confidence um, in what we're trying to achieve. And of course, it's encouraging to see the value that they placed on that business. Um, I think one of the reasons they went to the US, and I don't have any inside knowledge here, this is just my opinion, um, but the US offered them uh, an opportunity to buy into a project in construction, and there, there wasn't such an opportunity in Australia, um, and a project in construction gives them significant early mover advantages. Um, and it's those significant early mover advantages that we're looking to um, benefit from by being the early mover in Australia. Um, I mean, in terms of uh, Woodside's strategy for, for ammonia in, in, in Australia, I, I don't have any insight into that. What, what I would say is that um, you know, we're aware that many large energy producers and, and trading houses, for that matter, uh, are actively trying to figure out their decarbonisation strategy. and um, and in particular, what they need to do to uh, meet their safeguard mechanism obligations. And I, and I think making sure one meets those safeguard uh, mechanisms would be a very high priority um, for those, uh, for those uh, companies and you know, the extent to which ammonia might play a part in that. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, just a question here on incentives. Does your landed price of ammonia assume the HTPI incentive that was announced then here in Australia? Um, no, and thank you for to whoever asked the question. I should have made that clear. The, um, the numbers that I put up on that slide do not allow for any government incentives. So any incentives would improve our position from there. And the reason we haven't put them in is, you know, we're treating them as upside at the moment. We don't have a clear enough line of sight to um, include them in the base case. Any other competitors in Australia, your current stage of development that you would uh, want to flag, give some uh, promotion to? Um. I don't. I mean, I don't. I think it's hard 
to find, it depends how you define competitor. I think it's actually hard to find a competitor for us because when you look at, and I'm not going to name other people's projects or, or say, you know, uncomplimentary things about them. But um, what, I, what I would say is I'd challenge um, people to find a project that is in the same position as us. Challenges laid down. Thank you, Stephen. Questions are coming through thick and fast now, so I'm just going to keep asking them. Uh, what was the reason to choose ATR over SMR? Um, okay, I, I'm going to disclaim this by I'm not an engineer, um, but uh, effectively, it's a slightly different reaction. ATR um, operates at a much higher temperature. That higher temperature means that the reaction, the conversion of the inputs into hydrogen is much more complete. That means you get less CO2 in the exhaust and you can capture more of the CO2. So it's a much more, if it, it, it's a more efficient process if you want to capture the CO2. Right. Um, next question. What do you think is the biggest risk, the number one risk from a project level or market level? And how are you actively mitigating these? Um, it's, it's, a, it's a really good question. Um, the risks we have, um, one of the risks that we had was around um, was around gas supply. Um, I say it wasn't our, our highest risk, but we, we clearly um, had plans in place to manage that, and they're uh, they're coming good. I think I think the challenge is bringing all the moving parts together in an efficient um, and coordinated way, and that's really what's. Um, Know, top of my list. If you, uh, and I'll expand a little bit more about that. Um, we're talking, we're talking, we're a small company. We're talking to major companies um, around all the aspects of our project. Now, of course, as a leadership team, we've all got major company experience, so we understand how major companies work and what they need and so forth. The if I had to sort of summarize the the initial reaction we get from people is we really like your idea but gosh it looks quite hard to do are you going to be able to pull this all together and as they get to know us their their confidence gets greater um but what you find is that we're we're moving all of these people forward together but no one wants to take too much of a step out in front of everybody else and so that's where the agreement we announced on Monday is so significant, because it's showing that um, more and more large companies and institutions, whether it's you know, Water Corp or um, Chevron or whatever, are starting to um, step forward um, behind our project. There's a question here a bit off the project before a few on uh, Chevron and gas. Um, uh, thanking you for the presentation and congratulations on all the milestones to date. Um, just uh, given you're on the webinar, would you be able to provide a, a, an update on the legal proceedings with uh, GCM uh, announced in June and understand if you can't make a comment now? Um, I really just have to refer you to the, um, uh, to the quarterly report, which says um, the legal action was started by the counterparty. We believe it's with without merit, and we uh, will be contesting or are contesting strongly. And I, I can't say more. I'm sorry. Okay, our uh, two questions. I'm going to try to combine on the gas. Um, so Chevron covers roughly sixty percent of your needs. Um, uh, how concerned or? Worried are you about getting the balance and the potential timing on that? And then a question on what uh, indication actually means. I had not seen that before. And what is the pathway now to a firm MOU? Okay, um, right. So 
our strategy for gas supply was always to bring together a portfolio of suppliers. Um, and that's because um, those chunks of supply are more manageable for the suppliers, but also having a portfolio gives us operational flexibility, um, which is valuable to us. So um, we were always expecting to get three or four gas suppliers to, to, to meet our needs. Um, we're obviously very pleased that um, Chevron um, is the first of those to step forward and 60% is a, you know, will be the largest single chunk um, of our gas supply and we're delighted to have that. Um, in terms of the rest of our supply, we are in um, active discussions with existing gas producers around that. And so I don't have... Um, I don't have particular concerns in, in bringing those home, shall we say. Uh, oh, the, the other question I think was, what, what is an indication um, of supply? Um, yeah, so some, someone said, that sounds a bit wishy-washy to me the other day. And I said, well, you know, it might sound a bit wishy-washy, but actually it isn't. Um, we are following Chevron's process here. Um, and the indication um, confirms our mutual intent to negotiate a definitive GSPA, so gas sales and purchase agreement next year. And in fact, that is the next step. We go straight from indication to that definitive GSPA. More questions coming through and uh, a suggestion, um, which is a good one. Can you please reiterate that the legal issue is on the non-related sale of the graphite project and our legacy project and has nothing to do with this excellent project, please. So um, I think, uh, yes, that's that's worth stating. I'm, I'm having to thank the questioners a lot, aren't I? But no, thank you for that. I should have pointed that out too. So um, you are you are of course right. It is on a completely unrelated asset. Um, is the offshore carbon storage solution likely to be, and I don't know how much you can say on this, but likely to be an existing operation or a greenfield project? Uh, it, it will be a project that's currently under development. There are two um, CCS projects close to us of particular interest. One is the Santos owned and operated Devil Creek Reindeer Project. The other is the Woodside Operated Northwest Shelf Angel Project. So they're both, um, you know, they're both in the public domain. They're both looking at using uh, depleted gas reservoirs to, to permanently store the CO2. Um, and they each would have capacity to take our CO2 volumes. And they're being, uh, each is being developed on a timeline that, um, that makes sense for our project. Right, probably uh, time for just two more questions. Um, you recently flagged uh, the bunkering opportunity. Is that a change of approach or strategy? Uh, how does that compare to the scale of the Japanese opportunity? And can you pursue both simultaneously? Oh, um, okay. So it, it's not a change of strategy. Um, it's simply an additional market that we already, always had our eye on. Um, we, we still see the Japanese and Asian power gen market as the dominant market, if you like, for phase one with the, uh, the long-term offtake contracts um, and uh, subsidies and so forth that it offers. Um, but the shipping uh, opportunity is really significant. Um, the, the iron ore from the Pilbara to Asia trade is the largest tonnage uh, trade route in the world, marine trade route in the world. And all of those bulk carriers basically come back to the Pilbara in a hub and then go off to deliver the product and come back. And so the idea of refueling all of those um, uh, vessels with clean fuel at the point where they pick up the cargo is really attractive. We can do that in a much more efficient way um, than anyone else could. Um, in, in terms of scale, both markets are, are, are significant. So our, our project um, 
is going to produce 600,000 tonnes of ammonia uh, per year uh, for phase one. If we think about power gen, um, a single thousand megawatt power station, which is sort of a decent sized power station in Japan, um, if it was burning 20% ammonia, which is how they would start, that would need half a million tons of ammonia per year. And there are an awful lot of those power stations in Japan. So you can see that we're, we're a pretty small fish when it comes to that market. Arguably, the numbers on shipping are even more um, sort of spectacular. At the moment, there are, there are about 300 bulk carriers that, that work that iron ore route. And you would actually only need 16, so one six of those, to choose to only use ammonia as a fuel and to only bunker you know, at the Pilbara. And 16 would need half a million tons of ammonia. So I think we see them very much as complementary markets. And the beauty of it is that, you know, ex supplying the uh, marine market, the bunkering market, requires no additional capital investment. We're already taking the uh, product to the jetty, where it would be loaded onto the bunkering vessel as opposed to a gas carrier. Stephen, good questions are still coming through here, so I'm going to try to squeeze in another one or two. Um, question here on Japanese government uh, incentives. Uh, they've opened a tender for potential grant funding for ammonia projects. I uh, believe that's closing imminently. You know, what uh, impact could this potentially have on some of these offtake partners you're discussing and um, the appetite for them in terms of getting involved with WAH2? Uh, I think that, I mean, the main um, thing that's happened recently in Japan is that the Japanese government has legislated uh, or put the legislation in place for the um, contract for different supply chain subsidies. And so they, they are a fundamental enabler of, um, of what we're trying to do. Effectively, those um, CFD um, subsidies bridge the gap between the price that a producer like our, ourselves would want to get for our product to, to make an exit, a good return on our investment and the price that a Japanese importer could afford to pay while still selling electricity into Japan at an acceptable price. So I think, I think the fact that the legislation is in place is... Um, is a real enabler. People have been waiting for it to happen. It's taken a little bit longer than people expected because, you know, when they dug into the detail, there was some complexity there. I think the, the other thing that's come out that really helps us is that you, you might have seen on the slide that the Japanese um, pot of money is quite large. But of course, the bigger the subsidies you offer, the quicker you, you use up your... Um, your, your pot of money. And the Japanese government has, um, uh, has now advised that they want to spread um, their subsidies across um, a reasonable variety of projects. And so each project that uh, qualifies for subsidy is likely to be of the order of half a million tons, which of course fits extremely well with the size of our project. Okay, final question um, around, does the project require an experienced operator? If so, um, any sort of discussions already in regard to that? And at what stage do you have to introduce that operator to the project? Um, yeah, so, so, so Hexagon is not going to be the, the long-term operator of the project. To, to build that capability in the space of time is, is, is not the, um, the most efficient way to move forward. The, the, the most likely um, operator is going to be an incoming strategic partner that has the expertise and the appetite to, uh, to operate. And we, um, we do have discussions uh, ongoing in that regard. Um, one thing I would say about Petrofact, though, is that they, they have quite extensive experience um, of build, own, operate. 
And so that is um, an option that we have um, also, though speaking frankly, it's probably not the, um, uh, the most likely option. Thank you, Stephen, and uh, thank you for all the attendees that joined this morning and some excellent questions. I think we probably could have continued on for a while longer, but just conscious of time. Um, uh, Stephen, we will definitely get you back on again um, for another update in the not too distant future. Sounds like um, it's going to be a very active uh, few months ahead. Um, so there'll be lots of opportunity to uh, get you back on an investor webinar to update us on the uh, progress that you're making. Well, thank you very much for having me and, and thanks everybody for uh, taking the time to, um, to listen.